Hey, what's up guys? Coach Mac, playfestfootball.blogspot.com. Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, trying to recognize the difference between what actually might be best and what is actually best for you in your situation at your program. Um, and, and what I mean by that is sometimes what might be the best style of play or the best, um, the best type of fundamental or the best type of schematics at one level may not be what's best for you at, at the level that you coach at. Okay, so, you know, some of the things that we see every week in the NFL are not necessarily conducive to some of the things that we need to accomplish at the high school level. So, you know, as a high school coach, the toughest thing for you to determine in your program when you're thinking about offenses or defenses or off-season training program or special teams is, you know, do I necessarily need to look at what is the best possible thing or schematic or you know, uh, practice plan or whatever the case may be, what's the best out there or what's the best that works for me in my situation. So what I want to do is just take a couple simple examples that I think personally, you know, for me come up from a year to year basis and some of the things that we look at and, you know, then try and determine there, you know, what is actually best for you or what is actually best for me or what is best for us at the lower levels of football, you know, as opposed to maybe what the, the, you know, the, the, the big dogs do at the top levels in college or in the NFL. One of the first things I wanted to start it with is special teams and a punt look. Okay, about two years ago we switched to the, the uh, you know, the, the tighter shield punt or the wedge look um, where we had, you know, we had seven up front, all right, and then we had three in a wedge with a punter and, you know, we had pretty good splits between the centers, guards, guards, tackles, tackles, tight ends, and, you know, it was a theory where you tried to spill you know, everything with splits, you try to make guys rush wider, all right, and the guys that were rushing interior had to rush into, you know, into the shield or into the wedge, and, you know, what you were trying to accomplish is you were, you know, using some splits up front and the, the, the wedge or the shield guys, you know, you were trying to make it a little bit easier and a little bit sounder for your lower level kids with maybe not as good of a snap or not as deep of a snap or, you know, maybe a snap that doesn't get back there as fast you were trying to get something that was a little bit easier to protect when maybe you had less time to do it and less reps to spend on it so you needed something that might have been a little bit easier to protect so about two years ago we went to the shield punt okay and in those two years we've only had one punt partially deflected and that punt still went about 10 or 15 yards past the line of scrimmage and we've had no punts actually physically blocked and, and blocked behind the line of scrimmage that the other team recovered or advanced or recovered for a touchdown. So, you know, from a protection standpoint, in the two years of doing this, what we found is the protection is a lot easier for us. It's a lot easier for us to teach our kids. It's a lot easier for us to find the types of kids that can use or that can function in this style of punt, okay? But on the other hand, what we found was this style of punt, we've had three punts returned for touchdowns in the last two years. And what, what, you know, what I'm thinking as a coach, maybe that's because the three bodies back here are bigger bodies that can't get down the field and cover as well. All right, maybe because we don't have wider gunners getting down the field. All right, maybe these guys that are in protection on the front line, maybe they're not getting down the field as fast, okay? You know, or maybe in the games we gave up punt returns for touchdowns, maybe the other team on punt return had better athletes than we had on our coverage team. Okay, so, you know, there's a lot of different things that you can look into about the hows and whys of, of what, you know, of what you're doing or why certain things occur. But the one thing that I know for a fact is this style of punt for us has led to better protection with less block punts, but we've also given up some, some punt returns for touchdowns. Now, that's opposed to, you know, the traditional punt that you see on Sundays and a lot of college teams use, you know, where you see up backs or wings here with a personal protector and then you have gunners okay that are at what that are out wide all right and now within the protection of this these guys are going to have to give a little ground and seal inside first all right so they're going to give a little ground and seal inside first and then your personal protector is going to have to be a guy that can run the whole show and call out the different looks and you know, he's got to be somebody that fits where needed depending on the looks that they're running. And then you're going to need a real good snapper and a real good punter, all right, that can get on a clock in 1.3 or 1.8 or whatever the, you know, the average time at the NFL or college might be, that you can get this snap to foot, all right, and get this punt off 
So basically you're trying to spill everything wide here, and then your punter as he steps up the snap to punt to his foot has got to be able to get this punt off. Okay, so you know that's more of a traditional look you're going to see on Sundays and you're going to see a lot on, on Saturdays in college. All right, but I think you need better athletes to protect this style of punt. I think you have to spend a lot more time developing the techniques needed to skate back and get depth to make the edge longer. You've got to get depth here so that the edge of this punt gets longer, but at the same time you have to be able to seal your inside portion as you're getting depth, you've got to be able to seal the inside portion of your protection first so that you're spilling the corners wide. All right? You know, but in doing that, now you have these two wide gunners that are better athletes that can get down the field and try and force those punts. Okay? And then with these guys wide, a lot of times in the NFL you'll see double teams on those guys and you'll only see six in the box and one returner because they're trying to set up returns and you see very little fakes used in the NFL. So when you see this type of look, all right, it's probably better for coverage. You probably get better athletes on the field to cover punts, but at the same time, I think this type of look takes a lot more work and I think you've got to be better athletically up front with the techniques used or needed to use and be effective in this style of punt. So again, when you're looking at those two theories and punt, okay, you have to weigh the, the, you know, the pluses and the minuses to say to yourself, okay, for us in high school, what's a better all right, scenario there? What's a better theory? All right, should we use a theory where we are getting more punts off, all right, and, and we understand that, that we're not giving up punt blocks, but at the same time, our coverage unit is not as good, okay? Should we use a theory where our coverage unit is pretty good, but at the same time, we've got to spend a lot more time and have better athletes to use the techniques needed, all right, to protect that style of punt. Okay, so that's just one of, the, one of the issues or one of the arguments you can look at between two theories. The next one I'd like to look at, all right, is spot dropping versus pattern reading on defense, okay? So, you know, your, your spot dropping, your traditional spot dropping would be, okay, some type of system where you're going to drop to spots on the field and guys are going to have their eyes on the quarterback. So usually just generically speaking, all right, those spots on the field are going to be something like, let's say, the numbers, okay, the hash, the hash, okay, and the numbers, all right, and then maybe you say a third of the field, a third of the field, and a third of the field. So let's just talk about traditional spot drop country cover three defense. All right, where you are going to take a player and you're going to say, look, you're going to drop in the flat, curl the flat, and you're going to drop to the numbers, and you're going to drop hook to curl, and you're going to drop, okay, maybe two yards inside the hash, and you're going to drop to hook, to hook to curl. So again, this would be hook to curl, this would be hook to curl, this would be curl flat, okay, and this out here, you're going to drop to the numbers, all right, and this would be curl flat. All right, and then in the secondary, you're just going to drop and defend a deep third, a deep third, and a deep third, whether it be between the hash marks, you know, almost in high school, you can almost, thirds are almost identical to hash mark to sideline, hash mark to hash mark, hash mark to sideline, but as the ball moves from the middle to the hash, that's really not a deep third, so you got to do it by formation and get your free safety to split the number one widest receivers, and then get your corners maybe depending on the set, all right, your corners might have to apex or divide a one and a two, but in general what we're talking about is spot dropping guys to where they just have an area on the field that they're going to drop to, and you know, maybe whatever your depths are, if you're saying, all right, look, I want you to get six to eight yards, and I want you guys to get 10 to 12 yards, and I want you to get six to eight, you're giving them a landmark on the field to drop to, okay, and you're telling them that if they throw the ball and you get a pass read, you are going to drop to this spot on the field with this depth. It's a landmark, okay? And you're really not going to worry about what the receivers are doing or what the one or the two or the three do. You're really going to just drop, open, get to that landmark, settle, get your eyes on the quarterback, and be able to break when his front hand comes off the ball, and depending on what he does with his shoulder, all right, when his front hand comes off, that's when you're going to make your breaks, and then the front shoulder is going to dictate to you where he's throwing. 
So if he's got his shoulder in here or his shoulder out to the side, you know, that'll dictate to you where the ball's going to go so you can make your breaks accordingly when his front hand comes off the ball. Now, in that theory, okay, it's easier to teach landmarks and spot drops to kids. You're going to have more eyes on the quarterback ready to break on the ball, okay? So in thinking about that, with the, when you're talking about lower levels of football, whether it be Pop Warner, junior high, or high school, the amount of time that you might have with your kids to spend, the fact that they might be two-way players, okay, may lead you to think about spot dropping, all right, because it may be easier to get your kids in certain coverages, all right, whether it be, let's say this is standard, that's a standard cover three, four under three deep, all right, with curl flat, hook curl, hook curl, all right, curl flat, all right, and, and you know, basically just generically speaking, four underneath zones with three, all right, uh, deep droppers. And then explaining to your kids where the alleys are, you gotta worry about four verticals, teaching them the things or the routes that are gonna give them trouble, all right, and then defending it with those spot drops, knowing that you can get, all right, you can get uh, to your spot, to your landmark, and you have eyes on the quarterback, and it's easier for your kids to understand, all right? If you were, you know, maybe you were a two deep team, okay, and, you know, if you were a two deep team, you basically have maybe your corners up here, all right, and these are gonna be your flat defenders, all right, these are going to be your flat defenders. And then you might have a Sam, a Mike, and a Will, all right, with two deep safeties, maybe a free and a strong, okay. And, you know, basically you're going to drop the Sam, let's say again. You got a hash here. Let's say we got a goal post here. And let's say we got a hash over here, okay. And you're going to play cover two, so your corners are going to be your flat guys. Your Sam's going to drop to the hash, and let's say again, maybe 10 to 12. Your Mike's going to try and get to the goal post, and let's say 10 to 12. All right, your Will's going to get to the hash, and let's say 10 to 12, okay. And then your safeties, all right, your safeties are going to be deep half players, all right, and they're going to be, you know, 14 to 18 yards, depending, okay. And you know, for argument's sake, not talking about Tampa cover two where the mic is a deep middle dropper or, you know, the mic has to relate to three. Just talking about spot dropping, cover two, five under, two deep, where you have flat, flat, hash, hash, goal post. Guys can get to their landmark and their drops, get their eyes on the quarterback, break off his front hand, break off what his shoulders done. Okay? Then you can talk to your guys about the three areas, all right, sideline, deep middle of the field, sideline, the areas that are weak, the things that the offense can do to expose those. But in just a generic cover two example, you can have your guys where they are flat, flat, hash, hash, goal post, two half players. That might be a lot easier for high school, junior high, pop Warner kids to understand, all right, in cover two how to just get to that landmark, all right, and understand that area of the field that they have to defend with that landmark, that depth, eyes on the quarterback, break on the quarterback's throws, okay? Now, the problem with that, okay, is good offenses, good quarterbacks, and, and you know, good coordinators are going to, they're going to gear up schemes to put guys in space, whether it be in and out, high and low, they're going to put guys in space next to those defenders, okay, and they're going to put conflict on those defenders because the defenders aren't expanding or relating to the routes as they disperse. They're just going to a landmark. So they're going to put a guy inside and a guy outside, the curl flat defender, and they're going to throw off of what he chooses. They're going to put a guy on top of and a guy underneath the curl flat defender and throw off of what he chooses. Now again, because you're just dropping the landmarks, you're not pattern reading or matching all right, any of those things. And you know, if, if you look at anything that Nick Saban has done, and when he talks about his you know, his rip, list match, cover three concepts, he goes back and talks about the days in the NFL where they were spot dropping and playing man free, and he said that you couldn't spot drop and play country cover three versus Dan Marino, all right, and the guys in the NFL because they were just throwing laser beams wherever your guys weren't, all right, so they couldn't do it that way, and when you went down to play man free, if their men were better than your men, you couldn't make a living playing man free, so they had to develop something all right, that could cover the routes that they were seeing a little bit better. So they got into a pattern matching cover three concept, okay? And, you know, a pattern, and then it, it developed not only cover three, but pattern reading every coverage, where you had cover two with pattern reads, and then you had two read palms or blue, and then you had trips coverage with pattern reads, all right? And what ended, what ended up happening, you know, just to draw up simple scenarios for you, is you got into concepts where the routes dispersed 
All right, ended up, you know, the routes dispersed ended up becoming what your defenders were looking at to figure out or determine what they were going to defend. Okay, so for argument's sake, we'll just look at, all right, we've talked several times on this blog about palms or two read coverage. Okay, palms or two read coverage where you were going to play, all right, an outside linebacker, a corner, and a safety, all right, and then along with a Mike linebacker, let's say just to one side, all right, and those guys were going to play their coverages based on, all right, the displacement of the receivers and how those re receivers distribute themselves into the pack, all right, in other words, they're not just going to drop to a spot on the field and play ball, they're going to drop based on, all right, how those receivers distribute themselves. So you get into, you know, here's a one, here's a two, here's a three, okay, and now your corner and your safety were both going to release, they're both going to read the release of number two, okay, and they have their roles based on what the number two does, okay, so, you know, just in general, to keep it real simple, if two goes to the flat, the corner is going to play two, the, the free safety is responsible to get off number one, get on top of number one, I'm sorry. If, the, if number two goes inside, then the corner can play off of number one. If number two goes vertical, then the corner can play all of one. All right, free safety, the same thing. If two goes to the flat, i got to get over one. If two goes inside, I can either double one or possibly look backside to, to shallow or, or uh, shallow cross series with a dig or a dagger. All right, if two goes vertical, i got to play two vertical man-to-man. -man. Very simple, in theory, explanation of what two reader palms is. Not that simple in execution, but just... So everybody can kind of get the understanding of, of what we're trying to do here. And then your underneath palm dropper was going to be a guy here where you told him two doesn't cross your face and three doesn't get outside leverage on you. Okay? So now as he drops, instead of dropping to the hash of the numbers, he's dropping based off the releases of the two and the number three. Okay? So he's actually looking up the release of this number two receiver to make sure that two can't cross his face. And, and at the point that three gets wider than him and becomes the new number two, all right, now when he distributes himself to the width of three, the Mike linebacker is dropping off the number three receiver. So he's not dropping to the goalpost. He's not dropping, you know, he basically is a hook to curl defender until something brings him wide, okay? And, and you know, your, your, your Sam linebacker, all right, your Mike is a little bit more of a hook player. Your Sam linebacker is more of a hook curl until something delivers him to the flat. Okay, so, you know, it's two doesn't cross my face, three doesn't out leverage me, or I've also heard people say you're a hook to curl player until something delivers you to the flat. So the mic is more of a curl dropper until something delivers him to the hook in argument. You could, you could make that argument. All right, so if you were to get, let's say, the three was going out to the flat, at whatever point the three crosses the two, he's going to become the new number two. So now your Sam would expand to the new number two, and your mic would be. All right, dropping off to three, and now your mic would drop to the new number three. So for argument's sake, if you got, all right, if you got just a spacing or a snag, you got one on a snag, two on a corner, and three's going to the flat. Okay? What's going to end up happening now is your Sam linebacker is going to have to expand because three is getting leverage on him. Your mic linebacker, three is bringing your mic from the curl out to the hook, so your mic linebacker is going to expand to try and get on the snag. And then because two's going vertical, your free safety's going to have the inside half of two, your corner's going to have the outside half of two on the corner end. Okay? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to take that spacing theory with the flat and the snag, and we're trying to expand two defenders to cover that theory. Okay? So instead of just saying that the Sam drops to the hash and the mic drops all right, to the goalpost, now they can put a player inside the Sam and outside the Sam and put pressure on them. They can put a guy inside the mic or outside the mic or possibly high, low on the mic, okay, to put them in a situation of stress or conflict because they're just dropping to a spot. When you pattern read or pattern match, okay, now your guys are going to drop based on the patterns the offense runs. All right, so in, in just in simplicity, all right, or in simplistic terms, you're going to let the offense run their patterns and then let your defense cover the patterns after the offense, okay, distributes their receivers. So what you're trying to get to is in a, into a situation where you feel like you can cover almost every route the offense runs by pattern matching and pattern reading as opposed to just dropping the spots and letting them pick you apart. Now, the downside of that is this takes a ton of teaching time 
All right, you have to have kids that understand how to read the distribution of routes. You got to teach them the one, two, and three receivers, okay? And based on formation and possible coverage, two read is different than quarters, okay? It's different than trips adjustments. So you have different theories in coverage that you have to teach the kids, and then the kids have to understand those different theories in coverage. Okay, so for me, the thing I always debate on, all right, do I want to go ahead and teach all these pattern read and pattern match concepts, knowing that it's a better way to defend passes, okay? Or do I want to save myself some time in teaching, spot drop my kids, maybe traditional three deep country cover three or traditional five under two deep, spot drop my kids, break on a release of the football, and be able to spend a little bit more time maybe on individual fundamentals because I don't have to spend as much time on the schematics of those coverages. But at the same time, I know that the offense can pick me apart if they're really good in the passing game. All right, so those are things that I juggle all the time. I always go back to pattern matching and pattern reading. I think it's a better way to defend, all right? And I like to put the onus on myself that when we're not good, it's because I didn't do a good job teaching. All right, so I feel like I gotta be good enough to teach my kids how to pattern read and pattern match. I feel like I gotta be good enough how to get them to understand the difference between two read, quarters, robber, all right, cover three or matching cover three, if we do any fire zones, how to play matching fire zone concepts. I gotta be the one that's good enough to teach them that, all right? I feel like that's a better way to defend, but at the end of every year when I watch us with some blown coverages or some big plays that we give up, I always debate to myself, would I be better just teaching cover three, cover two, middle of the field open, middle of the field closed, these are the spots you drop to if you get past, drop there, read the quarterback, break on his hand and his shoulder, and let's play football. Every year I look at those things, and so far for 15 years I've always leaned back towards pattern matching, but at the end of every year I always look at it, and I always try and see how many guys out there might be getting away with just spot drop. All right, there's some out there that still do it. I don't think there's enough to warrant it, but every year I look at it, okay? Because again, that might be better for me than what is actually the better theory, where I, I feel like pattern reading and pattern matching is the better theory, but that doesn't make it better for me, all right? So I still right now kick around the idea of spot dropping, all right? The last one I'd like to talk about, all right, is more of a philosophy than it is, you know, a schematic, but the last one I'd like to look at is no huddle teams and the difference between teams that are check with me no huddle teams and teams that are really, really fast lightning up tempo teams. Now the difference in those two things is a, is a check with me team is going to be a team that doesn't huddle. They get their communication from the coaching staff on the sideline, whether it be signals or boards or you know uh, symbols, they still have to get some type of communication. Maybe it's wristbands. There has to be some type of communication from the staff to the players because they do not huddle. But when they get up on the ball, they're not operating at a lightning fast tempo. They're actually up there on the ball trying to see what the defense gives them, all right? And then they're trying to call, all right, what they feel like is the best play against that look. Maybe their best run to a bubble, their best option to a three technique, their best throw into cover two, their best throw versus a certain blitz, okay? So they're no huddle in communication, but they're not up tempo. They're on the ball using the check with me system. Some teams check with me twice. They bluff and then bluff again. They come out on a ball, down set hut, look to the sideline, down set hut, look to the sideline again to see if they can get the defense to bluff once. And then once they bluff and show their hand, now we can call our play. All right, I think the best example of that would be, you know, what Peyton Manning does in the NFL. Um, you know, the Colts and now the Broncos, they're no huddle teams. They're not extremely up-tempo. Uh, up they're not extremely fast. Peyton Manning's on the ball, and he usually has a run-pass option you know, probably two runs, two passes, more than that, but it's not as complicated as everybody thinks. Usually there's a run pass op uh, uh, option. Peyton Manning's gonna look at the defense and figure out what he wants to do, and then he's gonna make his checks or his audibles at the line of scrimmage, okay? The other theory would be the lightning fast up-tempo that Chip Kelly in Oregon made famous. Rich Rodriguez has been doing it. There, you know, there's a lot of guys that do it great. Baylor's doing a great job with it this year. BYU is playing faster than they ever have, all right? and you know, some of those might not even be for years. Oregon wasn't even the fastest team, but they always got the most credit because they were so explosive. Well, now Baylor is so explosive that they're getting a lot of credit this year, but they're not the fastest team either. But the difference would be a lightning fast up-tempo team would be a team that gets up on the ball and tries to run plays as quickly as possible so that the defense can't substitute and so that the defense can't have multiple blitzes and looks 
All right, because if you're going to snap the ball every 13 seconds, the defense has to be able to get lined up, get a call from the sideline, and play it. So you don't have a chance to make 35 calls. You certainly don't have a lot of chances to substitute in packages. All right, so a lightning fast up tempo team would be a team that tries to snap the ball every 12 to 14 seconds to eliminate, all right, looks from the defense and to eliminate multiple blitzes and, and to make it tough on the defensive coordinator to get his calls in. Okay, so. Those are two different no huddle theories, okay? Again, you have to look at what's best, what's best for you. Obviously, in the NFL right now, Peyton Manning does it as good as anybody with a check with me system. You know, in college, Baylor and Oregon have been as explosive as, as most teams in recent history. So that style or that theory, BYU is up there with snaps per game this year. So that theory, all right, has caught, uh, has, has caught hold a little bit more. And now that theory of lightning fast enough tempo is picking up. Is catching on and, and, and you know, kind of filtering its way down into high school and lower level football. For me, I like to lean towards the lightning fast up tempo theory. All right, you know, this year I wasn't as fast as I would have liked to have been, but here's my theory. A lot of times in high school or lower level of football, the guys on the other side of the ball, uh, the other side of the ball may be better, if not a lot better, than your guys. And you know, I want to control the game as head coach because I know how much film I watch and how much studying I do. I really don't know how much studying my quarterback does. He's 15 or 16 years old, okay? I'm 41 years old, been doing it for 17 years. I know what the game plan is and what I want to do, all right? By using a check with me system, you need a quarterback who can at least understand maybe what the run pass options are, all right? And at the same time, you have to understand that even if you get the looks that you like, if you execute, you can still beat that defense. All right, and in my experience, I played a couple teams that were so much better than I was that even when I got the right looks, maybe I wanted to run power at the big bubble, or maybe I wanted to run midline at the three technique, or maybe I wanted to throw to the flat versus a quarters coverage team. The guys on the other side were so much better than the guys on my side that even the good plays didn't work out all that good. I ran midline at the three technique, all right, and I played against a three technique that's starting at Florida State right now. And when I ran midline against a three technique, he tackled the fullback, the quarterback, and everything else in his way. Okay, you know, I would run power at a big bubble, and the defensive end would wrong arm my fullback four yards deep into the backfield. I'd run ISO at a big bubble, and the middle linebacker would knock my fullback three yards deep into my tailback. I'd try and throw a flat route versus quarters coverage, and the corner would either break or you know, if not pick the pass off, he would break and tackle my guy for a three-yard gain. You know, I tried to throw bubble screens in three-by-one into zone blitzes, three under, three deep. And I had, at one point, I had a team who would blitz from the three-receiver side, and the backside real linebacker was the middle hole three-dropper. And I had only a seam defender and a corner. And the nearest two players were the wheel about 20 yards away and the free safety about 15 yards away. And I was running bubble screens to number three, and their two-seam player was knocking my number two receiver over while he tried to block him. He was knocking him over and then almost picking off the bubble pass. I had a helmet for the seam defender, a helmet for the corner, and it was 15 yards to the free safety, 20 yards to the will, and I was running bubble screens away from those guys, and I couldn't complete a pass. All right, so I got to a point where I said, you know what, the check with me system for me doesn't work as well because I'm checking into all the plays that I think I should based on what I run and what the defense runs, and they're all getting blown up. Okay, so I went to a up-tempo, faster version where I said, you know what, I'm going to try and snap the ball every 12 to 14 seconds. I'm going to try and be an up-tempo team, and I'm probably going to have some negative plays. If you watch Oregon or Baylor or some of the faster teams, they have negative plays on first down. They just come back and run another play on second down. And it's not like you're running plays blind. You know what the other team runs. You have your scouting report. You've watched your film all right, all week. So you're running plays where you think they're going to set the front or what you think the coverages are, you're not exactly sitting there and checking them, all right, from a booth or from up top and looking at what they give you and then calling your play like the check with me teams, but you're still calling plays that you think are going to be successful against what the other team does based on your scouting report and game plan. So it's not like you're just throwing, you know, stuff against the wall, excuse me, throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks and saying, yeah, run this play. There's a theory to the plays you're running and the formations you're using. You're just up in a tempo so that they can't get their calls and their looks in, they can't substitute personnel, and you're trying to make it a you know third and fourth quarter game where their guys are gassed, 
all right? And you also are upping the amount of reps in practice you're getting, so there's a lot of reasons why I choose the lightning fast up tempo. But, you know, again, is that best for me or is that what's best? You don't see, you don't see a lot of teams playing 100 miles an hour in the NFL, number one, the roster size, you know, number two, you know, the depth at certain positions, and number three, that's probably not the best way for those guys to play. So it's not the best, you know, being lightning fast up tempo. It's not the best. And being a no huddle check with me team may not be the best because there's plenty of teams that still huddle and they're some of the best teams, you know, in the world or in the country at their level. All right, so it, it comes down to what's best for you, not exactly what's best. Those are just three examples of some things that I think you can look at. You can do it up and down across the board. You know, you can look at almost every scheme that's run at the lower levels that's not run at the higher levels or things that are run at the higher levels that aren't run at the lower levels and you can see that what's best for them is not what's best for us and vice versa okay you know defensively at the lower youth levels and even into the high school levels you'll still see a ton of three three stack teams with a lot of blitzes and a lot of movement okay but yet you very rarely see a base 3-3 team in college anymore. It's basically become a nickel-dime blitz look, and you'll only see it in, in certain nickel-dime blitz packages in the NFL. It's not an every-down defense. Okay, so obviously what's best for them is not what's best for us. So we have to be able to determine those things, all right, when we're looking at our program and, and our offense, defense, and special teams to try and determine what's best for us. The offseason is the greatest time to do that. Evaluate your film, look at your record, look at what you did, look at the teams you lost to. More importantly than the teams you beat, look at the teams you lost to. See if any of those coaches or friends of yours or guys you get along with, see if you can talk to them in the offseason. Go to clinics, try and visit college staffs, all right, and see what other people are doing so that you can have some ideas, all right, that you can take back to your place and see if they'll work. Always remember in high school, you don't really know. You may know what you have on varsity because they've been with you for three or four years. But every year when you get ninth graders coming in, you have no idea what you're getting. You don't know if you have a drop back pass or you don't know if you have an option kit. You don't know if you have run blocking O-linemen. You don't know if you have any size up front. You don't know if you're going to have good inside linebackers. You don't know if you're going to have four hands on the ground on defense. You don't know if you're going to have cover corners. All right, in high school, it's a crapshoot. Pop Warner, if you're in a neighborhood and you're playing with the kids in your neighborhood, junior high and you're playing with the kids at your junior high, we don't have drafts, we don't have recruiting, we don't have free agency. We can't match players to our system, okay? Sometimes we have to adapt our system to the players we have. So again, during this time of year, go to clinics, get on the internet, there's plenty of good sites and good access out there to free information. Go on, you know, Glazier, Nike, all the other clinics around, go to colleges, and even better, sit with guys that you're friendly with in high school at, or at your level, junior high, or pop one that have success. Okay? Evaluate yourself, evaluate your program, all right? And just keep in mind what's best may not be best for you. Okay? Remember, you won't play well until you play fast. Catch you guys next time.